I'm not sure exactly uh, if I made the, these points clear when we looked at that, and it'll come up again later. Second Corinthians chapter 4, and what we're talking about is the mystery of iniquity. Uh, the mystery of godliness is God working in us. The mystery of iniquity is Satan working in the world today and undermining what God's uh, accomplishing in the age of grace. He had to shift his, his attack on uh, the prophetic program to his attack on the mystery program. So it's the mystery of iniquity. And, and to find out what Satan is doing, the God has revealed to us his tactics. It said there in, in 2 Corinthians chapter 2, we're not ignorant of Satan's devices. And, and so we've been looking at just different places in Paul's epistles where he mentions the devil or Satan and, and warns us about the, the, the tactics of Satan in this age of grace so that there we'd be informed about the mystery of iniquity. Uh, now in verses, in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 3 through 6 is about Satan who is the god of this world blinding the minds of them that believe not, that's verse 4 there, lest the light of the glorious gospel should shine unto them. So Satan certainly doesn't want anybody to understand the gospel of the grace of God. And uh, that's because that's how a, a, a Gentile and a Jew is just equal to a Gentile today is translated from the power of darkness into the kingdom of God's dear son. And, uh, and the last thing Satan wants anyone to understand is the, is the gospel of the grace of God and Satan has blinded. Well, the mystery of iniquity, how does Satan, how is he the God of the world that's blinded them that believe not? How does he do that? Well, just keep that in mind as we uh, continue into chapter 11 in a minute. But uh, this verse just simply says he does. Uh, verse 4, I should have had you look at it and read it, but I quoted most of it. The other thing I want you to see in that, the beginning of chapter 4, uh, in verse 1, says, Therefore, seeing we have this ministry, we faint not. Uh, as we have received mercy, we faint not. But have renounced the hidden things of dishonesty, not walking in craftiness, nor handling the word of God deceitfully. So it talks about Paul's own character, and, and how he conducts himself, but ultimately not handling the word of God deceitfully. And, uh, and in, in that, that is exactly what happens. One of the ways that people mishandle the word of God is they never learn to rightly divide the word of truth. And you know, now Satan can actually use the Bible against them, just like the Lord Jesus Christ when he was tempted of the devil. The devil kept quoting scripture to him, but scripture that didn't apply, like like the angels, God will send his angels lest you get, dash your foot against a stone. Well, when you read that Psalms, that's about the kingdom and Jesus Christ's second coming. His first coming, he came to die. <laughs> so he did come to suffer. So t Satan took a verse to tempt Christ, but took it dispensationally out of context. And, uh, and, and so there's those who handle the word of God deceitfully that way. But then there's also the issue that's really uh, uh, a major issue, although most people don't think it's an issue at all. And that is the, the King James Bible, and do you have a Bible that's your final authority? And, and we believe that the King James Bible is the final authority for English-speaking people. Uh, a man that, uh, I think he's part of our streaming video, um, I know he is, uh, and, and an elderly man, very thoughtful, very considerate, uh, trying to find, really understand and how to settle the King James issues and a lot of times when he brings up like his own thinking, like I think that's the, some of these arguments are a little weak and if he talks to other saints they end up being an attack against him rather than reasoning with him and so he wrote me a pretty long email uh, about his concerns and uh, and when I emailed him back, rather than dealing with all the different, you know, historical, where was it before it was in the King James and all of that, is just the simple issue that God said he would preserve his word. And, and even before he said that, it's God's intent ever since the Tower of Babel to give to Israel the oracles of God because the, 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 mess, the word of God that would have been written in the stars prior has been distorted by, that's what Babel's all about, the witness of the stars is gone, so God wanted man to have a witness, and he, he would tell these prophets to write it in a book, as it says in Isaiah, that it might be preserved forever. So it was, if you just stop and think about it, it was God's intent to preserve his truth in a book. 
Now, he could have done it other ways. He chose to do it that way. Well, to think that he didn't accomplish what he set out to do is a problem. I mean, you can argue how he did it and how is it we ended up with it today and all, but all you got to do is read the Bible and realize God intends for us to know truth, and the truth is in the book that's called the Word of God. And, and therefore, you just trust that God did it. Now, if you compare the King James with all the other translations, you'll realize the King James is different. All of them are in one category, and the King James is over here. And when you check them out, the King James is always right, and these are always wrong. So you go, huh, it's that easy. <laughs> and, uh, and so I tried to give him a simple way of realizing, it, there's no doubt, the whole Protestant Reformation was based on the fact that the Catholics have always perverted God's Word. They, they never taught it right, they never believed the Gospel, and then, and then they pervert to God's Word. So the whole Reformation is the final authority, and then they would reject the Catholic version of the Bible, start looking for where the, the faithful Renman has preserved God's Word, because, the, like I say, the Reformation is centered upon that the final authority of our faith is the Bible. So you got to have a Bible that's your final authority. I say that because handling the Word of God deceitfully, there's two ways that are doing it. People are changing the Bible constantly just because they want to get their opinion in and the verse doesn't say what they want it to say, so they change the Bible to match what they say. It happens all the time. I went through Bible college. I didn't even, my professors, I just respected them so much I let them do it. And uh, it never hit me until, it was years after I graduated, some people said, well, then if you believe them instead of the Bible, they became your final authority. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> I better be careful about that, because everybody does it, and they don't all agree with each other when they change it. So, anyhow, that, that's one of the things about how Satan is operating. Certainly, the very first time you see Satan working, you talk about the mystery of iniquity, working is him coming to Eve, and yea, hath God said. And then he contradicts what God said, you shall not surely die. And, uh, and so you know Satan still doing that today, uh, attacking the word of God, and then people who preach the word of God, not preaching it rightly divided. So now come to chapter 11 where we left off. And, and again, I'll just begin at verse 1. It says, Would to God that you bear with me a little in my folly, and indeed bear with me. For I am jealous over you with godly jealousy, for I have espoused you to one husband, that, ye may be, that I may present you as a chaste virgin to Christ. But I fear lest by any means, as the serpent beguiled Eve through his subtlety, so your minds should be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. You know, when you look at that verse, and you'll see why in a minute, Paul's not worried about them... Uh, being deceived at the beginning, it, it's that they have the truth and they're going to be corrupted from it. And the reason they had the truth is when you get to verse 4, it says, For if he that cometh preacheth another Jesus whom we have not preached. <laughs> they didn't believe in Jesus Christ until Paul first preached to them. And when he preached to them, they believed in Jesus according to the revelation of the mystery. They believed the gospel of the grace of God. And they believed the, the spirit of truth that, that was delivered to them. So they had it. And now Paul's worried that someone else is going to follow up from his preaching and then do three things. And that's what we started to look at the next time, uh, last time. For if he that cometh preacheth another Jesus whom we have not preached, or if you receive another spirit which ye have not received, or another gospel which ye have not accepted, ye may well bear with him. Now, by the way, there's a verse about accepting the gospel. You know, some people don't like that term, but uh, they, they accepted the gospel. I guess the term is, is when you say you accept Christ, as if, you know, he meets your standard or not. <laughs> that's, that's uh, you know, you, you're, you trust in Christ. But, uh, but here they did accept, received, accept the gospel. But, uh, but, but those three things, Paul was worried that they would, someone would come along and beguile them as Satan beguiled Eve. So Satan is, is still operating in the mystery of iniquity, and what he would try to get a person to do is to receive, uh, uh, to, to preach another Jesus other than the Jesus Paul preached. And I think we covered that well enough last time, is, is, is it's the same person, the Lord Jesus Christ, that came to earth as Israel's Messiah, fulfilling all that was in the prophets concerning what God promised the nation of Israel. But in the age of grace, 
Jesus, God is accomplishing something different through Jesus Christ than, than the prophetic program. There's been another plan of God that was kept secret since the world began, that God is a, fulfilling a purpose in Jesus Christ today with us as members of the body of Christ, and therefore when we preach Jesus Christ, we don't just preach him, we don't preach him today as the Messiah of Israel. You might hear us preach, here's Jesus Christ, when he came to earth, he was Israel's Messiah, fulfilling the prophets, but that's not what, how Jesus Christ is preached today. Jesus Christ has preached that he gave himself a ransom for all to be testified in due time, whereof Paul says, I am made a preacher, a minister. He says that he preaches Jesus Christ according to the revelation of the mystery which was kept secret since the world began, but now is made manifest. He preaches Jesus Christ as the head of the body, not the king over the nation of Israel. That God today is not forming a nation, he's forming the body of Christ. And, and Jesus Christ, we're the body and Jesus Christ is the head. And, uh, and so, uh, if you don't preach Jesus Christ according to what God's accomplishing through Jesus Christ and through the death, burial, and resurrection uh, of Jesus Christ, what, he's what God's accomplishing today, you're preaching another Jesus. And it could be even Israel's Jesus, could be the right person, but the wrong program. And, uh, and so, Paul warns that someone could come along and preach another Jesus. And then he says, or if you receive another spirit, which he have not received. And, uh, you know, it's got a small s on there. We're not just talking about you receive the Holy Spirit. And, uh, you know, the, the, the Bible uses spirit a lot of times a couple different ways. Uh, th like you have a spirit yourself, and your spirit is the seed of your intellect. And, and, and uh, you can receive another spirit can actually be the idea that you receive a whole other message than the Spirit of God has for us today. Um, that, that, you know, it's not, we have the preaching of Jesus Christ, but then you have the whole doctrine of grace that Paul says, well, he actually just says, let, if a man be spiritual, let him acknowledge the things I write unto you are the commandments of the Lord. And, uh, and you, it, the same thing happened in Thess, 2 Thessalonians where he says uh, that they were deceived that, that either by word or by spirit or by letter from us. And I always look at, what do you mean by spirit? There is a, a, a message, a doctrinal understanding that people receive that could be not the spiritual understanding God would have for us today. And that would be receiving another spirit. It doesn't mean like you've got a demon instead of the Holy Spirit. It means you receive the wrong message. Uh, a couple different ways. Let me show you a couple verses in Job. because. I, every time I come across that word spirit, I think about how to express that properly. Uh, so last time I kept talking about a doctrine, receiving a doctrine, or here you can see it's, it's actually getting a, a different understanding. Uh, Job chapter 20. This was fresh in my mind because it was used in a program that I recently edited. Is this thing working today? I think it is. You know, it wasn't working two weeks ago. Called out the service man, paid $116 to find out it was working. <laughs> uh, Job chapter 20 and uh, uh, verse 3. And this is actually uh, Zophar who's talking to Job. And, and it says, uh, uh, I have heard the check of my reproach and the spirit of my understanding causes me to answer. And knowest thou this of old, since men were placed upon the earth, that the triumphing of the wicked is short, and the joy of the hypocrite is but for a moment. And so, you know, it's a, they understood that doctrine, and, and, but he's talking about the spirit of my understanding causes me to answer. And then he tells his, what his understanding is. Of course, he's accusing, accusing Job of, you've had a good life, but you've been a hypocrite all your life, <laughs> and now it's over. <laughs> and so he's not right. But the whole point is that the word spirit of my understanding, and Paul says, if you receive another spirit, if you've got another understanding other than, than the, the message that Paul has delivered, not just about the Lord Jesus Christ, but the doctrine of grace, uh, there's another place in Job, uh, chapter 32. It 
says in verse 8. He said, But there is a spirit in man, and the inspiration of the Almighty giveth them understanding. See, it's your spirit is the seat of your intellect, and you ought to get your understanding from the inspiration of God, <laughs> the scriptures. And, uh, and, but you need the truth of God to feed your spirit with the right understanding. Another spirit would be not the spirit of God, not the inspiration of God, not the truth of God entering into your spirit of understanding. And, uh, and so Paul says, if someone else preaches, another, uh, 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 not preaches, if you receive another spirit in, in, uh, which ye have not received, uh, Paul gave him the right spirit of truth. Um, another place, just this is the one I normally go to, look at 1 John chapter 4. First John chapter 4, and uh, we'll just follow from verse 1. It says, Beloved, believe not every spirit. Now there's a small s. And how often do spirits talk to you? Well, watch how, how is it that you, you're not to believe every spirit? There's other spirits out there. But try the spirits, whether they are of God. Because many false prophets are gone into the world. Oh, if he's, if he's a false prophet, then the spirit of, of understanding from him is going to be false, right? So, the way you try the spirits is listen to the prophet speak, and it says this in verse 2. Hereby know we the spirit of God. Every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh is of God. So that's a man teaching that Jesus Christ came in the flesh. He's speaking the truth of God. So that is the big spirit, the spirit of God, the inspiration of the Almighty, right? Verse 3 says, And every spirit that confesseth not that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh is not of God. And this is the spirit of Antichrist, whereby ye have heard that it should come, and even now already is in the world. So that spirit of Antichrist is the, the teaching that, that Christ is uh, that Christ Jesus Christ is not come in the flesh, that he was just a spirit and that his spirit in, in, in dwelt this body, but he's gonna Jesus the spirit is gonna come back and indwell a different body in the future. That's the spirit of Antichrist, because the Antichrist is not gonna say he's Jesus Christ, he's gonna be the Christ the, and have the, the same spirit Jesus had, the Christ spirit. And, and deceive people that he is the Messiah, the Christ. But, but anyhow, you see that the false prophet is preaching this, and you listen to what's being said. Trying the spirits, I always share with you, <laughs> like Barry at the tent meeting we went to, the guy's up there healing everybody, and they're slain in the spirit. Mike Barry jumps up and starts walking down the aisle. <laughs> he thought that verse, I'm going to go try the spirits, see if he can slay me. Well, the worst thing would have happened if he would have got electrical charge and got knocked backwards. That's not how you try the spirit by your emotions or your experience. You try the spirit to find out if he's saying what God said in the Bible. <laughs> that's how, that, you know, if he says what God said, that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh, then that's of God. If they say Jesus Christ did not come in the flesh, that's not of God. <laughs> that's the spirit of Antichrist. That's the doctrine of the Antichrist. And, uh, and so you see the word spirit, how it's used there as far as spiritual understanding, whether it's of God or not. And so Paul is warning there in 2 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians chapter 11, if someone preaches another Jesus that he didn't preach, that they might bear with him, or if you receive another spirit, uh, that, that, which ye have not received. And that would have been the teaching that Paul would have brought to them, the spirit of truth. And then, uh, and then the last thing in, in 2 Corinthians 11 verse 4, it says... Uh, um, or another gospel, which ye have not accepted, ye may well bear with him. So the warning is, is that someone could come and preach another Jesus, another spirit, and of course another gospel. Well, we asked the question a few moments ago, how does Satan blind the minds of people that believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel should shine unto them? Well, he places the true gospel with a false gospel. See, it's always harder to get someone saved if they already believe something false. If they just empty-headed and didn't believe anything, you have a chance to get them saved. <laughs> a better chance, I should say, to get them saved. 
But if someone could convince them a false message, and you know they got a whole church you know, and a real eloquent pastor who keeps teaching them the wrong message, and how could all these people be wrong, and how could this great man be wrong, and, and they embrace a false gospel, well, then Satan has now blinded them from seeing the true gospel when it's preached to them, the gospel of the grace of God. And every gospel that adds works to salvation is a false gospel. That's you know what Galatians is all about. The we are an angel from heaven preach any other gospel unto you than that which ye have, we have preached unto you, let him be accursed. The gospel that Paul preached to us is the gospel of our salvation. And if they're preaching another gospel, a gospel other than grace, a gospel that involves works, a gospel that does, isn't solely centered in the finished work of Jesus Christ on the cross, it's a false message. And it doesn't save, by the way. A lot of times we want to think that, well, these people are good Christian people, they just got the gospel wrong. Well, if they're trusting the wrong gospel, they're not saved, they're blinded. Lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ should shine unto them and then be saved. Now, the, the hope is, is they actually trusted the right gospel and then someone taught them wrong. Because then they're saved, just taught wrong. And that, you know, even Paul says here, uh, a gospel that you have not accepted. The gospel the Corinthians accepted is the gospel Paul preached. <laughs> uh, then someone else would preach another and corrupt them from the simplicity that's in Christ. Uh, but if someone believed the false mo the gospel in the first place, well, they never got saved. And uh, I told you before that one of the men I used to fellowship with would ask the question, he, he, he always you know, would get confused over whether people are saved or not. So he learned to ask the question, he says, what is it that you believed when you first believed? That's how he would ask people about their salvation. And that way he could get right down to it, you know. Because, by the way, that man's testimony is that he was in a Pentecostal church and he saw a brilliant light. Look down in verse 13, because here's the, the next point. It, in Corinthians where it exposes the mystery of iniquity. Verse 13, For such are false apostles, deceitful workers, transforming themselves in the, into the apostles of Christ. And no marvel, for Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light. Therefore it is no great thing if his ministers also be transformed into ministers of, of, of righteousness, whose end is according to their works. And... Uh, you know, if, they're trans, if, minister, if Satan's ministers are transformed into ministers of righteousness, the, Satan's ministers are not preaching, you know, go smoke dope, shoot up, get drunk. They're not preaching that. They're preaching righteousness. They're preaching that you need to live a good Christian life and do what Jesus would do and, and, and preach all good works to make you think that, well, I'm living a pretty good life. God will accept me. I'll have eternal life. And, and that would keep them from trusting the true gospel that, no, you're a sinner. No matter how good you think you are, your righteousness is like filthy rags in God's sight. And you need to come to God as a sinner because Jesus Christ died for your sins. It says even when you, uh, it says that Christ, I was going to say that in Romans 6, 11 by 6. Uh, for when we were yet without strength, in due time Christ died for the ungodly. Well, if he died for the ungodly, you better take your place there. <laughs> you're, you're part of the ungodly that Jesus Christ died for. And, uh, but his ministers are ministers of righteousness. In verse 13, they also are transforming themselves into apostles of Christ. Now, apostle is a little different than a minister. An apostle is one who can actually make up the word of God. <laughs> because an apostle, like Paul, an apostle, where did he get his message? Directly, a revelation of Jesus Christ. An apostle is one sent by Jesus Christ with a message. And everybody who stands up and prophesies today is, in a sense, a false apostle. They're saying, Jesus Christ sent me to say this to you. Well, that's what an apostle is. And they're not teaching God's word. They're false apostles because they're teaching a false message, but saying they're sent with, by Jesus Christ to preach that message. And then, well, that shouldn't marvel us, because Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light. And I told you, the, the reason that the minister friend of mine began to ask people, what is it that you believe when you first believed, is because he realized at one point, even he was already preaching the grace message, preaching the gospel, and then he went through a time of depression, thinking, am I really saved, or am I just preaching to people to be saved, and I've never trusted Christ myself? Now we're all saying, well of course you did, you preach it, you must believe it. <laughs> but that wasn't satisfying him, 
And, and the reason it didn't satisfy him, his testimony was, he's sitting in a Pentecostal church, saw a brilliant light. What? He didn't get saved that day, did he? So then when did he get saved? Well, he might have got saved along the way when he learned the right message, or he might have just learned to say the right message and never believed it himself. Just testimony of my own mother. She was raised in Church of Christ. Works for salvation. Clearly. They don't, they don't even try to say it's, that it's not of works. They, absolutely it's of works. And, uh, and my mom, years, when we first, Sanjay and I first moved back to Michigan, and mom tending the church a little bit more than when we were younger, began to get real disturbed. She says, you know, I don't know if I'm really saved. And my, my statement to my mom is, well, let's not worry about whether you were saved. What are you going to trust right now to save you? Make a decision right now what you're going to trust in. If you've made it in the past, God knows, praise the Lord. If you never made that decision, make it now and settle the issue. And so she did. And, and that's exactly what this minister did to get out of that depression. If I wasn't saved before, Lord, right now, this is what I'm trusting in. I'm going to trust the gospel, the grace of God. Because, boy, Satan is working. You know, you go through, go through all the cults. In fact, I just read over the weekends, uh, Kurt Kincaid sends me these, all these different things. Sometimes they're political, but a lot of times they're about end time. And he, he, this one, well, two, two articles was about the world order, but not the world order from a political point of view, from a satanic point of view. How every different facet of what they call the new world order actually has a satanic root. And, uh, and, and that was pretty clear, but also the last one he sent me was about the, the Muslim and what Islam is all about and, and, and how the reason you can't pinpoint what a Muslim believes is no one knows what they believe because it was all made up at the beginning and you, they just grab different points and you have different clerics saying different things, but, but all came from an angel of light that appeared to Muhammad in the desert. And we all say, no, he didn't, he just made all this up. Maybe, maybe not. But they all believe that their message came from an angel of light. Not realizing, in fact, the article I read, I believe, was a Muslim who finally read the Bible and said, oh, now I know where the Muslim faith came from <laughs> and got saved. Because, you know, Mormons, all the rest, this, the angel of light shows up and all of a sudden there's a false message being preached. So, you know... How does Satan blind the minds of the people? Well, it's through preaching a false message, being looking like a ministry of Jesus Christ when it's not a ministry of Jesus Christ. And, uh, and, and so uh, this is how the mystery of iniquity is working today. One other place I want to cover today, chapter 12 of 2 Corinthians. And in verse 1, let me just start out and, and hopefully you understand that even though Paul's going to talk in, a, in like a third person, he's talking about himself, but himself in a spiritual sense. It says, it is not expedient for me, doubtless, to glory. I will come to visions and revelations of the Lord. So Paul's talking about himself coming to revelations of the Lord. I knew a man in Christ about 14 years ago, whether in the body I cannot tell, or whether out of the body I cannot tell, God knoweth. Such a, one, uh, such a one caught up into the third heaven. And I knew such a man, whether in the body or out of the body, I cannot tell, God knoweth, how that he was caught up into paradise and heard unspeakable words, which is not lawful for a man to utter. Of such a one I will glory, yet of myself I will not glory, but in my infirmities." Now he's going to start talking about his infirmities, but he's talking about the spiritual man he was. He don't even know if he was in the body. At, but he received an abundance of revelation. He's going to receive more revelation. And he was caught up in the third heaven and received revelation. But he's not going to glory in himself. He's going to glory in that truth. And he's going to glory in his infirmity. Why is he going to glory in his infirmities? It says, For though I would desire to glory, I would not be a fool. For I say the truth... But now I forbear, lest any man should think of me above that which he seeth me, seeth me to be, or that, uh, uh, or that he heareth of me. And lest I should be exalted above measure through the abundance of the revelations, there was given unto me a thorn in the flesh, a messenger of Satan to buffet me, lest I should be exalted above measure." So Paul's this one who received this revelation, but he also received a messenger of Satan to buffet him, lest he be exalted with pride. 
God allowed to receive, him to receive, and it's called a messenger of Satan. And, and it says, For this thing I besought the Lord thrice, that it might depart from me. And he said unto me, My grace is sufficient for thee, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. So Paul's attitude is now, More gladly, therefore, I will glory in my infirmities, that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Therefore I take pleasure in infirmity, and reproach, and necessity, and persecution, and distress, for Christ's sake, for when I am weak, then am I strong. Now, what I want you to see in that is the messenger of Satan is a discouraging message focused in on a person's weakness, on his infirmity, and the fact that God refuses to change that infirmity. Paul prayed three times, take it away, God didn't do it. The messenger of Satan, what is the message of Satan trying to do with Paul? Convince Paul that if God don't take away this infirmity, you, you, don't, you can't go out and be his apostle to the whole world. You're weak, you don't have the eyesight, you don't have the strength, you don't have the ability, you're too weak to do this. It's a discouragement, and so Paul prays, Lord, take it away, and the Lord says, no. Now Satan grabs that, and says, all right, quit. But Paul turned around and realized God's grace is sufficient. That in his weakness, God is made strong. We talked about the, the, the mystery of godliness is Christ in us, right? And, and the power of Christ in us. And Paul's experience that God's grace is sufficient. So how does, what is one of Satan's ways of working the mystery of iniquity? Of trying to get you to think you can't, you're not sufficient, you can't do the work of the ministry because you're lacking here, you're lacking there, you're weak this way, or God didn't take away this infirmity that you have, and so God's actually working against you rather than helping you, getting you not to realize that His grace is sufficient. And, and Paul, rather than falling under the mystery of iniquity there, under Satan's message of discouragement and quitting, uh, Paul just realized... When I'm weak, then I'm strong. I'm going to glory in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. But that's how Satan operates. And, uh, and a lot of people get discouraged because God didn't take away their problems, their finances, their, and, and all, all the different things that pe people want God to do. And he's not doing what they want him to do. He is, he is in them if they're saved. And his grace is sufficient for whatever thing they're going through. And... Uh, but they'll believe the message of Satan rather than the message of God that his grace is sufficient. So that's, that's just going through Corinthians of how Satan is working. Let's pray. Our God and our Father, we do thank you for your word. And we thank you, Father, that we can have the spirit of truth when we just believe your word rightly divided and, and the importance of believing it in a King James Bible. Um, some of the things that we could have brought out, we didn't quite get there to to express that even further, but Father, I pray that uh, each one of us would realize that the King James does stand out different from all other Bibles because it is uniquely your word to the English-speaking people. Uh, help us to study even further in the next hour. We pray in Christ's name. Amen.